Was that acting? Was that overdoing it in a Hollywood style with him talking to the branch? Not at all. I'm embarrassed as to how many times I've talked to a tree or a branch or a rock. And don't you effing break? Yeah, that's exactly what I'd be saying. Hey GQ, I'm Les Stroud and welcome back to part two. We're going to be looking at more jungle survival scenes. This is The Breakdown. All right, let's check out another scene from the movie Jungle. So what we have here is hallucination. I'd be hallucinating too. And the reality is that when it comes to hallucination, it doesn't take long. It starts with your dreams. You want to have great dreams? Don't eat today. The dreams are intense. This is how uh, uh, indigenous cultures would have vision quests. They would not eat or drink. And then the dreams would be insane. Well, when you go this long, like Yossi has, those dreams become uh, strong while you're awake. You start being unable to differentiate between I'm asleep and dreaming and I'm awake and this is reality. How probable is it for Yossi to just walk through the jungle and stumble into some quicksand? Uh, it is very probable. Again, he's hallucinating. He's exhausted, starving, thirsty. The vision goes fuzzy. And you can walk into just about anything. With everything else that happened to him, I'm amazed he didn't just bump into a big old hornet's nest in the jungle, and they are nasty. Good little move there. You get into a situation like quicksand, get the backpack off. Anything that's going to hold you down, take it off, try to get it away. If you're wearing a hat, just throw it. You know, get, get stuff off uh, because everything that is attached to you is going to be a hindrance and is going to uh, work against you in trying to get out of the mud. A little bit of acting going on here as far as the reach out to get his passport. It's a little bit of acting, I mean, he could have just sloshed and gotten it. Good thing he didn't though. Here's the problem with quicksand. Every movement you make serves to make you sink down. So just making big moves with your legs, which you want to do because you're panicking, will actually take your neck, your head, and start to sink you lower into the mud. It's very dangerous. And again, when it comes to hallucinating, remember just moments ago he was hallucinating and now he's in the mud and even though that reality is going to wake him out of it, he's so exhausted that he's going to drift back into it. I think old Tarzan movies gave the impression that quicksand is like sentient and was working to pull you down. No, it's just Physiologically speaking, uh, it, it works to pull you down. The movements you make, make force your body to go down deeper. But it's not like quicksand is sitting there like uh, some kind of carnivorous plant waiting for a human to happen into it so it can grab it and pull you down. That's not what's going on here. But they don't want to tell you how long he was out for and he's probably passed out uh, and, and slipped in and out of his hallucinations. It's actually a good thing. The thing that I push probably most for in a survival situation over many other things is sleep, is getting rest. Without rest, without, I mean, this is how you can be tortured. This is how you can be trained in the military. Go without sleep. Mostly going without sleep is a mental state of torture that I, I, I don't like it when I have to have been in those situations in the jungle or the desert or somewhere else in a survival situation, no sleep. It's really torturous, but any sleep that you can get will give you that moment of energy to get out of the situation. That's what's happening here. Okay, so that's the proverbial olive branch that the jungle is kind of putting out for him to grab onto. Uh, it's tricky reaching for branches and leaves. They break, they split, 
they pull out. And so getting, as you would say, you know, it's like getting solid footing, but getting a solid grab is tough. And uh, in a situation like this, it's almost the only thing that's going to get him out. Being active and busy will force his body down. The idea is to try to get as flat as possible. All the time laying there is you're not going to just float to the surface, but you're going to stabilize and really at that point it's about your mind manipulating your muscles, your legs, your arms, your fingers so you, so you can actually picture the way your body is and think about the maneuver out and at this point he's relaxed enough to notice if he reaches out a little bit he can grab this leaf. That's the right way to do it. You can't just grab and pull. You have to get enough of a hold on that branch that that leaf is not gonna rip. And so twisting and twisting, pulling and twisting as he pulls, all of that is giving him a stronger and stronger grab as he goes until he can get to the stronger part of the branch. Stay with me. Don't you break. Don't. A branch like that absolutely can be strong enough to use to pull yourself out of a mud hole like that. In fact, there are very, very thin strands in the jungle, thinner, thinner than my baby finger, that are super strong. So, not knowing the species of the tree and all of that, notwithstanding, the reality is that uh, the thickness of the branch is not necessarily going to indicate how strong it is, and some of the thinnest vines in the jungle are powerfully strong. Was that acting? Was that overdoing it in a Hollywood style with him talking to the branch? Not at all. I'm embarrassed as to how many times I've talked to a tree or a branch or a rock. And in a desperate situation like this, don't you effing break? Yeah, that's exactly what I'd be saying. His body's up a little bit high there um, because he's in something they've made in this, you know, they've created. He's not in a real mud hole. They've made this for the sake of the movie. So he, he's getting his elbow on a perch there. It would have been better if he was still sinking low and pulling himself out. But the truth of the matter is, in the, for the sake of the story, he's completely exhausted. So pulling out inch by inch is a reality. <laughs> They've done a good job of realism of how it looks, but this last moment right here, you know, he's basically already safe. And there's a little bit of play here, like there's a monster holding his foot. That said, there is a ton of suction. It's like in, a, in regular water, if you're wearing big rubber boots, it's hard to get out of the water because the rubber boots fill with water and, and they, that suction kind of holds you in. The mud, there is a suction there. I think they're just overplaying it just a little bit. So much for the pack. Best way out of a situation is to back away, right? You get you go into a, a, a yard with a bunch of mean guard dogs, the best thing to do is back away slowly because what's behind you, you already know about. You already know that what is behind you is safe. In the situation of a mud pit, back away. You just walked on solid ground. That's where the solid ground is. If you go forward, you don't know if it's 30 yards away before you see solid ground again. But in the Hollywood sense, you know, they got to play the scene out a little longer, a little more dramatic. So it looks like he went forward. Me, I would have gone backwards. Here's the thing about Yossi Ginsberg and his story in the jungle. When I commented on his experience from the perspective of a survival instructor, so I was a little cold hearted about it. He gave me the best, strongest, most powerful story of somebody who survived by pure will. Everything went wrong for him. He had no luck, and luck is a component of survival. It's just there for you sometimes. He went through horrifying mental uh, uh, anguish, but he kept going forward. His will to live was one of the strongest wills that I've ever learned of in any survival situation. Next up, Rescue Don. Dwayne, Dwayne, Dwayne. Come on. You gotta try. 
Tim's not gonna kill you. No, just try. The concept of somebody not eating quote unquote food in this situation when you're really, really hungry, that's a hard one for me to accept because generally speaking, I find people go just a few days without food and anything. If someone says, here, eat this, you just do. No matter how squeamish you are, I've never seen a survival student, maybe people I've taken out in classes and that, not eat what is available no matter how much of a creepy crawly it is. It could be alive, it could be dead, it could have fangs, it could have claws, it could look real, real bad. I'm gonna eat that rice. Huh? Ah, I'm gonna eat that rice because it is my rice. You are not. I will eat huh? my rice. We're not gonna eat that rice. My rice. That is not your rice, that is our rice. I think that eating creepy crawlies in a survival situation has been played up so, so, badly in all of the survival shows that are on television. It's just become this big melodramatic moment when somebody's got to eat something gross. When the truth of a survival situation is that you could eat the wrong bug. If, if the impression is out there that, well, a bug is just a bug, it's gross, but it's good for survival, not so. There are plenty of bugs that you can eat that are poisonous and you should not eat. Uh, well, let's take a look at a scorpion. Scorpions are actually quite tasty but you don't want to eat a scorpion with the stinger still attached. So there are, there are some nuances to eating creepy crawlies. Survival has been sensationalized on television that there are bugs that people eat alive uh, and it's you know like, oh, so gross and, and all of that. And the reality is most of them are much better dead. I've eaten lots of scorpions and I've eaten one live scorpion. And that was really more than anything kind of just showmanship. It was just me saying, oh, you can, you can eat it alive. But if you can get a fire going, almost everything is better roasted. I'm going to eat that rice. Huh? Ah, I'm going to eat that rice because it is my rice. You are not. It comes down to survival as a group. Now, that's something to remember. There's a big, big difference between solo survival, uh, dual survival, or group survival. And the, I will say this much, the, the disadvantage of being solo survival is you have no help for anything, obviously. But the advantage is that if you were to find something and you're alone surviving, it's all for you to eat. But in a group situation, you have to share. I'm not gonna let you out of your handcuffs tonight, okay? Because I still have the key. Hmm? It's like Lord of the Flies, man, groups, and, and their dynamics, the, it just all falls apart uh, as time goes on. And the thing about leadership that's really intriguing is it can change. And that leader's been established through their group activities long before the survival situation. And we all know that's the leader. However, when the survival situation hits, oftentimes that leader is not the right person for the job in the new situation and someone else rises to the occasion. This is a prisoner of war situation, nothing I'm familiar with, but the laws of survival still apply when it's a group and jo jockeying for position of leadership is gonna happen before long, absolutely. And that's of course what's happening here, they're starting to jockey for leadership. You're the warden himself now. Is that right? Is that right? Do I have that? Get that right? <laughs> You know, one way to have done this would have been to say, we all need to eat this. We all need to stay alive. We need to get our nutrition. So, divide it. The process of doing that, of, of measuring out the mealy bugs and worms, it actually takes it away from being gross and disgusting and turns it into food. You ration until you get more. And then sometimes you can go, great, time to pig out and eat a whole bunch of stuff because there's lots. But if you ration and you never get any more, then you're doing the right thing. This is also where it gets real tricky in a survival situation with a group because if someone hoards food and they didn't, if they, or, they, or if they had food and didn't share. Okay, next up, romancing the stone. <laughs> okay, let's make some time. Okay, well that's dramatic. Let's just throw our survival pack over the cliff uh, because that's just a lot 
better to do that than actually keep it on your... Yeah, no, you never part yourself from your gear in a survival situation. You should have your own pack in a survival situation and you should hold on to it. So yeah, sorry. Two seconds into it and the character's already blown it by throwing the pack over the cliff. You Okay, I guess that was motivation. Why she was able to fall that fast, well, that's called movie making. Nobody falls that quickly without knowing it's coming. <laughs> so first of all, could a mudslide go for that far? Absolutely. There are hillsides in the jungle that go forever. And once the rain starts pouring down like that, those little mudslides do tend to erupt just about everywhere. Now, not to the point where you just like, fall all of a sudden like these guys did, but if you were to slip on one and start going downhill, this next part, other than some bad camera technique, is actually kind of sort of realistic. Big, long mudslides in the middle of the jungle, and they're that slippery. So, was it realistic that they went down like that? Yeah, kind of was. Now that's actually kind of realistic right there. Jungle crazies, adrenaline junkies. You know, you get through something that's like was horrifying and they're like, Yahoo! That's why they call them Yahoos. Uh, it, uh, yeah, I know guys like that. That's probably the only time that I get like that because I'm not an adrenaline junkie, but at the end of something that could have killed you and you're standing there alive, if there's any time to shriek for joy, that's it. I said, are you hurt? What's the matter? Are you paralyzed from the neck up? Are you hurt? No! Let's comment on the rain, first of all. Does it rain like that, that hard, for that long, all the time? Oh, absolutely. I've been in the jungle before where I've watched it rain that hard and harder for eight hours without stopping, and it can go longer. But I'll tell you how they get a downpour like that. A little behind the scenes movie making. It is almost impossible to film actual rain. You have to have these big, huge sprinklers and it has to be really pouring hard. Even if you want to make it look like a light rain, it's got to be pouring hard. And think about it. When was the last time you saw a scene in a movie where it was raining lightly? Yeah, there almost aren't any because you can't show it. How do you show just a gentle rain? You can't. So every rain scene in every movie, I defy you to find me a scene where it's not pouring. It's always pouring because that is the only way they can make it work so that the camera can actually film it so that we can actually see it. Here's another reality in this scene though, or lack of reality. And that is that everything that he has in his backpack, the gun, everything is in perfect shape. Nothing fell out, nothing ripped off. They went an awfully long way and he managed to throw her pack perfectly down to where it was supposed to go. That's yeah, Hollywood. Okay, next up, Apocalypse Now. That's a nice little scene there. In terms of the ecosystem reality, uh, you might be surprised to learn that there's actually a lot of sand beaches in the interior of jungles is when you get rivers, you you do get sand beaches. It's just they're in places you wouldn't expect to see them. Into the jungle gathering mangoes. I meet Raquel Welch. When you're on a jungle river, those overhanging branches, you have to be really careful because that is where you will find vipers and different snakes, spiders, poisonous ants, you name it, that's where they are. They're hanging in those clusters of branches. Any poisonous snakes around here? If you're going to be in the Vietnamese jungle and asking the question if there are poisonous snakes, then you clearly w w missed the memo. You weren't paying attention to the briefing. I'm gonna go eat some mango. It's so hard to find real fruit in a jungle situation. Most of the time you're looking at big, fat, green leaves. I have been in places where I've been able to 
gorge on mangoes. And the only way I could do that was they were the ones that were falling on the ground because I can't get up to the tree to get them. I've heard people say, oh, you'll be fine. You can live off mango or you can live off blueberries. Yeah, if I'm there in the season when they're ripe and I can actually get to them. That's the catch when it comes to finding fruit in any survival situation. I come from New Orleans. I was raised to be a saucier. Great saucier. What's a saucier? We specialize in sauces. Actually, I don't mind this kind of banter. I've never been in the military service, uh, so I can't speak to that. But I've been in lots of situations like this, walking through a jungle, either on my own, but also with other people too. And your conversation meanders always. You just talk about nothing most of the time. Or you start to get to know people because what else is there, is there to do? And if you're not looking at something specifically, like a big old spider or a snake, you're just talking about nothing and walking. be a mango tree here somewhere. Those fans at the bottom of that tree are so beautiful to see up close. Indigenous cultures would actually use them for communication. You could go up to it and, and kick it. Boom, boom, boom. And wait a bit. And you hear someone miles away. Boom, boom, boom. So they would actually do that for communication. I, I did it in the Amazon jungle, for example, banging on one of those and then listening to someone re reply from miles away. It's, it's, that's pretty cool. Look at the color on that scene. I mean, this is all filmmaking and it's beautifully shot, but when you're in the middle of a jungle, you get to see colors like nowhere else, shades of things, and, and there's a rich matte finish most of the time. There's sun in the jungle. You can be in places where the sun comes through, but a lot of the times it's this matte finish look to everything. We lined us up in front of a hundred yards of prime rib. All of us, you know, lined up looking at it. Magnificent meat, really. Beautifully marbled. Oh, big mistake in the jungle. You don't just sit on a log. If I were to walk outside right now, I could go and sit down pretty much anywhere. In the jungle, you don't do that. You come up to somewhere and you look around it, you look under it, you look on the other side of the tree, you brush it a bit, and then you're like, okay, whoa. Okay, good. Because the chance of there being a snake right underneath his ass or ants that hurt a lot going right by his boot uh, is pretty high. So, a little sloppy there, Martin. When you've got a predator lurking about, watching for signs is really important. When I was in India, uh, I was paying attention always to certain monkeys because they would go crazy. Whenever there was a tiger, they'd start going crazy. That was my warning sign. And you can do that with a lot of different species. So if you watch what else is going on, you will then begin to notice that something has changed, which means something else has entered the picture. <laughs> if there's one thing that makes me nervous, in different ecosystems, it's big cats. When I was in India, I had to spend the night in a tree because of a big tiger, and I could hear it growling. Yeah, cats give me the willies sometimes. The thing that's wrong with this scene is that the tiger's attacking from the front. Cats like to attack from the back. Sharks are the same way. In India, I wore a mask on the back of my head to ward off a tiger attack because it sees your eyes. So in this scene, it's a face-on-face -face encounter. Can that happen? Yes, it can happen. But 99% of the time, a big cat wants to attack you from behind. I think a final thought on, on the Apocalypse Now film is that uh, they, they went for an incredibly intense, dramatic presentation overall. But, but when it comes to the jungle, uh, it was, it's warranted. It, 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 it's very dark and, and there, it has an ambiance to it that is not like walking in the forest in Northern California. So much more is there to be uh, dealing with than just, you know, whatever the storyline happens to be. In this case, it's, it's a wartime story. Thanks for watching The Breakdown with me.
Take care.